Hello, everybody. I'm Tony Young, uh, CEO and President of Rise San Diego. I'm really excited today because we're going to talk about the emerging voices of Gen Z. And I know for, for some of you, it might be a kind of a confusing uh, group of folks who uh, kids, and they're not kids. These are people who are leading major real efforts. And what we try to do is find some of the, the true leaders uh, of this uh, generation and allow you to understand kind of what they're thinking, where they're coming from, and, and really get a glimpse of what the world is gonna be like in the next 10 to 15 years, because these are the people who will be leading it. And we recognize that. And so we're excited to be a part of that. Um, as uh, you, you participate with us, I'll give you a little bit of insight of how to do it. Uh, we will have obviously, um, you know, a, a, a real discussion led by uh, you know, by our, our moderator, Selena Viegas, and we're going to focus on, on just really in-depth issues that are affecting this generation. As you guys see there, uh, RISE is, is really about um, leadership development, nonprofit partnerships that we do a lot of support for, and in this case, what we're doing now is the RISE Now civic engagement activity that we do. Um, the other thing is how to engage with us. Uh, you, you're going to have Selena is going to lead our um, our discussion, and then uh, you will participate through the chat but box, or you can put on or put messages into the question and, and answer box, and we'll try to get to you and, and give you uh, a response uh, based on your question or your comment. So. We appreciate that. And I want to say thank you all. We have uh, Lupe, uh, Ezra, Noodle, Azariel, and Sophonius, who are a part of the panel. And um, of course, the amazing uh, Selena Viegas is going to uh, be the moderator. So thank you all. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it. And uh, you see a lot of people are popping up wanting to listen to what you have to say. So uh, thank you, Selena. There you go. Well, hi everyone, good evening. Um, so this evening we're hoping to learn a little bit more about Generation Z um, and those that's been indicated as those that are born between 1996 and, and 2010. Um, so we've heard the word, you know, Gen X and, and millennials. And so the next generation, here it is. That's what we're, we're hoping to introduce you to. Um, hoping to talk a little bit about how their unique beliefs motivations and the concerns and practices are shaping the way that they interact with and, 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 and contribute to their, um, their neighborhoods and their communities. As we know that this generation has been raised on the internet um, and social media. And so with some of the oldest finishing college this year, and some of them are entering the workforce. Um, and so again, we're, we're happy to have, I'm happy to be here, I'm happy to speak to um, who our panelists are, we're going to start with a, a, a poll question to try to get a sense of who, who do we have in the room. Um, and that poll question is going to be what, you know, what year were you born? How do you identify in terms of all these generations? Uh, so we have, you know, Gen Z, um, which is 1996 to 2015, 1981 to to 1996 um, for the millennials, Gen X 1965 to 1980, and then 1944 to 1964 for baby boomer, baby boomers, excuse me. Um, so if you could just please indicate real quickly who we got in the room. I think that that'll uh, help us make sense of um, how to move forward with this. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, okay, so we got 29% uh, identified as baby boomers. We got 35% of Gen X in the house, 35% uh, of millennials, 
and nobody from Gen Z is here except for the panelists. So that's really, really, really interesting. So you all are basically representing yourselves. Um, okay, cool. So again, we're going to speak to the interests and the motivations and the styles and the needs um, of, of Gen Z. Um, as, you, as I think I'm experiencing it, they're very different from um, other generations. Um, and so let's, you know, let's try to get into it. Um, we have a second question for the poll question, and that's going to be uh, in terms of your perceptions of how we even characterize um, the generations, uh, you know, help us indicate about, do you feel like this is a helpful tool to understanding the differences between ages? Do you feel like, uh, do you feel like it's useless and it's stereotypical, it doesn't mean anything? Um, do you feel like there are significant differences that need to always be considered or remembered? Um, and then, of course, you know, the younger generations, we have a lot to learn. They have a lot to learn from the older ones, and they don't seem to realize it. And the last one, the older generations have a lot to learn from the younger ones, and they don't seem to realize it. Let's see how we're feeling. Very curious to see. Seems like some folks are having a hard time trying to figure out where they stand. It is a good question. <laughs> I saw somebody add that in the chat box. It's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. I would agree. All right, all right, y'all, let's see what we got. Okay, so top three answers. So it seems like 42 is basically, it is helpful for us to understand the differences between the generations. Uh, there's about 26% of us that think there's significant differences that need to always be remembered. And then the last one is that the older generations have a lot, a lot, a lot to learn from and the younger, from the younger ones and they don't seem to realize it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That is very, 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 very helpful. Um, so let's get into it uh, with, with the panelists. Um, starting with Natalie, aka Noodle, um, what, how, do you want to be, how do you want to be seen and experienced? There's um, something that I want all the panelists for us to consider is that like, there's like this other side of Gen Z that kind of gets looked at as like, you all are just lost. You're always on your portable, portable devices. You're always taking pictures of your food or yourselves. And so you're kind of out of touch with what's really going on. But I don't really think that that's the case. So how much of that is true? And how do you want to be seen and experienced? Sure, thanks, Selena. Hi, everybody. My name is Noodle. I was born in 1996. I currently reside in South San Diego. And I was asked to be on this panel and talk about my perspective and my identity as a generation Zer. Initially, I was a little confused. I'm not gonna lie. I think a lot of different websites and infographics will say anywhere from 1995 to 97 is the start and end of millennial and Gen Z. And so now what I'm seeing is I exist in a cusp. I exist in between generations and that's not bad for me. Um, immediately, I think, am I one of those? Gen Z years, I have four younger siblings. And so what you're describing to me is very familiar, but oftentimes I don't see that in myself, but yet that is how I'm perceived. 
Um, and so how do I want to be seen? I think I want to see be seen as both because that's how I feel and that's how I identify. I think being at the start or end of any kind of period means that you're going to be able to absorb what comes before and what comes after. If I'm going to be honest, I feel that I'm on the older, I, I guess I am on the older edge of the Gen Z generation. And so I feel that I have a lot to learn from folks who are leading and who are far more, you know, far younger than I am. So I want to be perceived open-minded, open-hearted. Um, and I do identify, I think, deeply with millennials. But as I read more about Gen Z and hear more about Gen Z, I also feel like I could belong there as well. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this to Azrael. How would you answer that? <clears throat> well, I mean, I just want to be seen just as another person, pretty much. Um, I think that there shouldn't be any judgment um, in any way, but I think that some some of the things that people say could be true. I mean, like, we spend a lot of time on our phones, and that could be at sometimes a bad thing, because um, it, it could be used as a distraction, but it could also be used as a tool, um, as you mentioned before, in uh, organizing movements and stuff like that. Um, so I guess it's looking at it um, neutrally. Um, but also looking at it in a way that, you know, um, people can learn from this generation, but I think that this generation also can learn a lot from previous generations. Okay. Ezra. Yeah, so I think that, like, so I'm 20, um, and so being classified as Gen Z kind of, I don't know, it it kind of feels like a power move in a way because we're so, like, oh, you, you're Gen Z, like, you don't know anything. But then we go out there and we change the world and we show them that we can. And so, like, it feels almost like a power move to, like, reclaim that. And, like, I'm happy to be Gen Z. I'm happy to be whatever. And I think that, um, like, the, a lot of the stereotypes about Gen Z, like, always on our phones and things are misunderstood. And sure, we could probably be less on our phones, but that's the most accessible way to engage in activism. I mean, for disabled people, that's almost the only way. And so how can we shun that when that's an accessible and like, it's just like an accessible way to um, engage and create a community. And so I think some of the stereotypes are misunderstood. Mm. I hear I hear it in your voice. <laughs> okay, um, let's go with Sophonias and then L L Lupe. Okay, um, for me, Gen Z doesn't like, I never really saw myself as Gen Z because I feel like we never really got classified till recently. Um, but I mean, I feel like technology or something, that's every generation has that phase. Like when people started writing on paper, they thought that was that was like the most immoral thing you could do. Then they went to te television and now the same attitude where it's like, it's rotting your brain. And yeah, like too much of anything can rot your brain. But I feel like our generation, at least now is like learning how to utilize it as a powerful tool. And if I wanted to be categorized as Gen Z and the thing I'm proud of most is what's been going on the last few months. Cause it's kind of showed that our generation, at least youth across, across racial lines, across, across class lines show that they're, they're serious and that they want change in the country. And, mm -hmm. uh, forgot I had one more point but it kind of slipped my mind but yeah that's that's my thought for now okay, thank you um yeah I, I resonate with it all um I am one of like uh I'm a young professional so usually I am always like in between am I a young person am I still being at participant in spaces or am I already that like adult in the spaces right like mentoring young people um but I found it interesting, the second question that you all put on the poll and have uh, much more older adults in the space right now. Mm -hmm. um, I am a big advocate <laughs> for youth adult partnership and <laughs> I'm currently exploring what it means to be in a youth adult partnership um, because it looks very different and it has changed and evolved over the years. And as young people, um, I like to believe that like our own lived experiences and wisdom and knowledge is enough to be in, to be in powerful spaces, right? Or positions of power. 
Um, and when I think about like Gen Z and like millennials, um, I feel like this this narrative and idea of go get your degree and then you could go ahead and enter these spaces. Uh, then you'll you'll be enough. Um, so I think for like me as a young professional, like I want to be in spaces where youth youth and adult can co-create and uh, build together, right? And and we talk a lot about like this uh, youth ladder of, of arts ladder of youth participation, right? And moving towards like a youth adult equity um, and less on like consultants, <laughs> consulting a young person or tokenizing a young person. Um, so I think for me in spaces, like I would want to be seen as equal. Um, I know that like my knowledge and lived experiences is more than enough. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think that that's v very powerful. And I think that that's something that um, Azaria, like felt like you were trying to say that I just want to be seen as human. Like, I don't want to be seen as a young person in the room or, you know, I'm representative of, you know, of Gen Z, even, even though you, you are, but that's, you're more than that. Um, and so thank you for naming that. Um, and it also gets me a lot thinking about um, identity and what is important to you. And so we had some folks recognize um, in the chat box that we're very clear about our, our pronouns. And so there's a lot of, a lot of language and um, Ezra, you kind of spoke to it that like, you all are changing the world. You all are, you know, also being prescribed as you're the generation that's not doing anything, but you're also the generation that like, what is, what is about them and those pronouns? Like, why is that so important all of a sudden? So I'm wondering, Ezra, if you can start us off by speaking to what are, what are the parts of your identity that are most important to you? Um, and how do you show that? Um, so I am a queer, trans, disabled um, person. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I'm non-binary and I'm proud of it all. Um, and the emphasis on pronouns for me is because it just makes life like bearable for me. It, because how would you feel if you were constantly misgendered? And so I tell people my pronouns all the time and it is a risk because I'm outing myself essentially but it's worth it for that respect and that like affirmation. And so I think that like people will see that and be like, oh, they're snowflakes. They just want to be like special, but we just want to be happy and accepted. And, and we're building a world where that is more possible and more normalized. And so I think that that's the like, recent uptake in um, like pronoun usage, gender expression, things like that. Okay, and for, for Natalie, I saw you snapping. So if you, you help us out here a little bit too, what are parts of your identity that are important to you and how do you show that? The first thing I thought of, you know, when I was thinking about how would I answer this question, it's not just about changing the world, it's taking responsibility for our world. And I think that's, I feel a collective identity with younger generations in general. We've been handed a lot of circumstances that were out of our control. And so now what you're seeing is a lot of young, younger folks making the world that they belong and they can see themselves in. Mm. And so for myself, my identity as a Panay, a Filipino woman, as a queer woman, as a young person, and all the intersections, you just can't get that. You know, it, it, it's not something that a box can tell you who I am, but every intersection changes the way that I'm perceived and I show up in this world. And it's very important to me that those parts of my identity are recognized, but also that they inform my work. And I think the biggest informant of my work is, um, my role as an older sister. So mm -hmm. very family oriented. Yeah. Um, but honestly, I think that's what it is. The younger generation is now experiencing more freedom, more ability to express themselves and create circumstances where people are now seeing them for who they are. We have words, we have resources for this. And I, and I still do wanna recognize older generations in the room. It's because of the work that you laid out for us, the structures that you set, that we're able to critically question, that we're able to change. And so I give you credit for doing that legwork. 
and like every new level of life is going to demand a different system and different us. So we're making the world that we want to see. I felt that. I hear that. <laughs> I hear that all the way. And I, I partly feel responsible for that. I'm, I'm not Gen Z, but I'm the generation before. So it feels like we're neighbors. And so I'm, I'm also out here yelling at the older generation, but I'm also a part of the older generation. Um, Azrael, how do you identify and, you know, how do you, what, what parts of your identity are most important for you and how do you show that? That's part of my identity that I like um, reflect about and that I observe um, pretty much on daily is uh, being Latino. Um, and I mean, it's just like, a, it has a, a decent impact in, in the way that I see um, I guess it's the world around me. And ever since like, I went to school, um, and I, where, where I used to go to school here in the neighborhood in Barrio Logan. And then I transferred to a school in La Jolla where it's majority white. And it was just like super different. And then that's when I started noticing differences and stuff like that, where I started uh, noticing, um, just, just being more observant, I guess, of power structures and stuff like that. And just the way that um, people treated each other. Um, so I say that that would probably be the biggest one. Okay. Um, thank you. And um, Sophonius, you said something earlier about, you know, this idea of um, the, the technology and even the Generation Z has been classified recently. And every generation is going to have that thing that they're annoyed about from the past generation. So how do you think that, that people your age or, you know, the folks that do exist in that generation are affected by the events um, and the technology and the culture. Um, I want to. I wanted to actually hit the points like that you said about um, us being kind of related and kind of like being so close to each other. Sure. I think that's very important to remember, just because like we wouldn't be here today without without the like without the people that suffered during the like the war on drugs, without people that suffered through like through misgendering, through violences like on on trans folks. And I feel like that's that's really what the heart of it is because. The, the social movement in the 60s wouldn't have happened without the struggles in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And it's like, and it builds up. And I feel like, I feel like what we're doing today is not really what we're doing now. It's just more so like the people before us and just the stories we've heard and the pain we felt finally just kind of bubbling over. And mm -hmm. uh, to get to your original question, like the question about uh, how I want to be unidentified, I feel like it's important to identify like my whole identity as like, as a, as a black man, as a, as a cisgender, I mean, cisgender heterosexual, as a first generation immigrant. And I feel like, I feel like as, as I operate in the power dynamics and as I'm affected by the power dynamics, I feel like that, those are both important things to hold on to because I'm not fully, I'm not fully oppressed, but I'm, and, and there's some, in some ways that I kind of do play to that oppressed role. And it's, it's the importance in just knowing and like managing those, those ideals at once and understanding when to give space and when not to. Yeah, and how, how do you feel like that has that has affected the way that you move, that you move about your life and, and how, how you want to, you want to show up. Oh yeah. It's moved. It's changed everything, honestly. Um, uh, to, and I'll honestly, before I got to, to Berkeley, I didn't really understand just the, the gender dynamics and just separating sex from gender because those conversations weren't really had in our communities, but it's like, it's the idea versus like being willfully ignorant versus being like conditioned to be ignorant. And I feel like I was for, for a long time conditioned to be ignorant, internet access, just like leaving my community wasn't very accessible. And we were just kind of like, what you had in your community was about it and you're not really gonna leave. Um, but once I got to Cal, once I got exposed to all the information, it really just changed my views. And I think that's when I started to understand the power of language and just mm -hmm. the power of words and how they can harm and how they can uplift. And I feel like that's why our generation is so, so, so intentional about how we use our words and just so deliberate about how we wanna frame things because words have power and words do hurt people. Words uplift, bring people up. That's why people quote Martin Luther King's speech to this day because it has power, it has impact, just, just like negative words do too. Right, I, I hear that. Um, and and for, for, for Lupe, I'm wondering the same thing, you know, what, let's, let, let's just try to frame it a little bit. Um, I know it, it's a really heavy question, but you know, how did, how does, what you've been affected by events, technology, and the culture, how does that affect how you show up and how, and how um, you have to identify? And I think Stefania said it pretty beautifully, um, right? I, 
Yeah, for me, um, I look at all the different identities that I carry and the intersections of it, like Natalie was saying, um, right? There's some identities that people won't just know at the top of <laughs> by just looking at me. Um, and I mean, I, I was born and I come from the lands of Mexico um, and was raised here in San Diego, right? But people looking at me will know that I'm undocumented, but it's probably one of the most <laughs> biggest identities and largest identity that has impacted the way that I show up and the way that I think, the way that I behave, right, the issues that I am uh, leaning towards. Um, but I think Stefania raises a good point of we live in this community and, and a lot of communities where access is not there or these um, learning opportunities like how do we understand um, uh, like how Right, these systemic uh, changes, and uh, when, once we go that, uh, like we're, we're not really aware of what that means for us as an individual. Um, so for me, I kind of have to understand too that, like, although I am undocumented, like I have DACA, that means I have a work permit. So that changes my role within my own community. Um, so then I begin to advocate for like folks who don't qualify for that work permit, right, and. I think it just gets very complex sometimes to even like full on take that identity sometimes when I have a lot of privilege uh, because of that work permit that they gave me. Um, so how do I continue to uplift folks who have not had that access of resources, um, education access, right? Like, so I think I'll keep it short <laughs> and that's what I would say. Yeah, um, and for Natalie, I see you nodding a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So I'm wondering if you have something to add to there. Recognizing, you know, sitting with the fact that um, we're all, it, the panelists here are all in currently in college. I actually graduated from undergrad and the privilege of having access to the education is important. And that's why I want to throw it back to Gen Z because what I feel is going on right now, and that's what the pandemic and quarantining happening more phone usage, more connecting over the internet, but we're seeing this almost mass ethnic studies happening on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook. You don't have to go to college to learn about your history anymore. Mm. Mm. I wasn't politicized or awakened until I hit college, until I took my very first Asian American studies course and I was 18. And so sitting here at 23, you know, knowing what I know now is because of my degree is that really was the catalyst for all of it. Now Gen Z's out here. I'm learning more about current events on TikTok than I had on Facebook or Twitter combined in my undergraduate career. So that that part that Lupe is talking about, access to education, access to technology. When I think about Generation Z and the work that they're doing, that we're doing, see, I'm trying to distance myself and, and identify at the same time. I see it as a bridge. You know, not only is it reaching folks in our generation, but now we're able to share this information with older generations. And so I really do see Generation Z as this bridge of bridge of conversation, bridge of understanding. And, you know, it, it is as much of a crossroads as it is a bridge for a lot of folks. But that access to education is changing people and we can see it. You know, I can see it in my own family. I see it in my friend circles. And I'm honestly so grateful for that. Yeah, I um, I see I see Sophonius is really 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 excited in, in his little screen. So I want I want you I want you to I, I want you to share that energy. Honestly, everything because I forgot to mention that as a, as a student, it's like you have cr incredible privilege because there's because before before Berkeley, I was just another black black student, black black teen walking around. But because Berkeley legitimizes me, because Berkeley gives me power. I now have a lot more freedom to move in a different way. And same thing, same thing with what Lupe was mentioning too, because I was, I was born in Ethiopia, but I moved here when I was six, thanks to a lottery system. And mm. as I got my citizenship at the age of 15, my life was really different because I used, I used to never really see myself as American, as a citizen. And I was always seeing myself in a duality because I understood, I'm like, I'm not here permanently. Any day now they could just really take me away or just like re re pull my visa. So it's, it's important to understand that it's like, there's always somebody that has a different, that goes through different, different struggles and different intersections. And it's always important to, to wear that because even, even with my status as like ex, as an immigrant or like as a first generation student, it's important to remember because people love to like 
can like make this an issue like okay immigration is a brown issue police violence is a, is a black issue it's it's an everybody issue because police violence affects white people it affects if it affects brown people in the form of ice it affects it affects um black people obviously through, through police violence same thing same thing with immigration there are refugees from africa there are refugees from all over the world that need housing that need protection so it's just yeah no when, whatever natalie said yes double on that i echo that yeah so i'm wondering um Azrael, so I know that, um, like me, you come from a space of like an after school program where they, we preach a lot about being the first in your family to go to college as if that's like, you know, I mean, it's, it's celebrated as a moment of success, but also I'm wondering, like, how are you, how are you, you dealing with that as being celebrated for being, you know, a part of a, 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 a movement to be the first in your family to go to college and to get that degree, but also acknowledging your privilege in that. So, cause you, what was the question in that part? How 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 are you dealing with how how are you dealing with that the, the the complexity of having the privilege of of being the first in your family to go to college, but also mm. realizing that this information is readily available on Instagram. If I I can share it right now, I can share a whole you know reading list, and you don't necessarily need to sit in class for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely, um, it w the work to get to college was not like all me at all. Um, I think a lot of people contributed, um, and I know uh, a lot of us can can relate to that. Our parents' parents' sex point. I myself, I'm also undocumented. I'm a DACA student, and so my parents they came over um, to this country. They tried getting me here so that I could become a citizen, um, but right before I was born, um, the 9/11 attacks happened, so it was impossible for them to come here um, and and have me born here so I could be a citizen. But yeah, I mean they 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 did a lot when they for, for me to go to college, as well as um, nonprofits such as BOCI um, and you know school counselors and stuff like that. Um, so that's uh, that's that's. I don't know if that was exactly your question, but yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if, if anybody else can 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 speak to that. I know um, for Lupe, I know that you and I were part of a similar organization that you know wants folks to be the first in their family to go to college, but also this information is readily available. At, you know, as explained, and Ezra, if you can speak to that too, you're majoring in 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 in, in ethnic studies. Yeah, um, I mean, when you go on Instagram, you see, especially now, these like compilations of free PDFs of just amazing works and. Right. educational works and so I think that you know I love college I it's I'm so happy there and so that's part of it for me is just like getting the education and also being a part of changing things on campus because um, I am going into my second year at USD and within three months of my first um, semester there, I was a victim of a hate crime and um, a transphobic and homophobic hate crime. And the university didn't protect me and they didn't help me in the way that I needed. And so part of me being on the college campus is to ensure to have someone there to hold them accountable, to keep bringing these issues up so they don't get swept under the rug. I mean, there have been a multitude of hate crimes on that campus and every campus. And so a part of it is sort of like infiltrating the institution to create change from within. I see a lot of nods. Who's gonna speak to it? Um, I, I think I, I was gonna touch back on something that um, Ezreal said. Yeah. Um, and it goes back to, he said, like, you know, that there was a huge uh, support system for him here um, that got him right to where he's at. And I think that's something I, when my youth development work, right, like we talk about, it's not just putting these, uh, putting young people in spaces and being like, go figure it on your own, right? But it's giving them those tools to be able to learn how to navigate the spaces that they're in. Um, and I, I will say, right, like I was part of an organization that helped me get to college. Um, and I had a huge adult accomplices and uh, who were there to tell me the reality that I was in, uh, right? Selena's was there all, <laughs> all the way editing my UC applications. Um, 
but like I had young, I had adults there who told me, um, this is your best option. Why? Because no other institution would give you or serve you as much financial aid uh, because you're an undocumented student. Um, and sometimes like young, well not sometimes, like all the time, <laughs> young people need adult accomplices who are gonna be real with them. Mm. Um, that it's beautiful for them to like dream big and have visions and like think beyond, um, but being real with them and, and letting them know the reality that they're gonna enter when they're going into these next chapter of their life. Um, so I, I just wanna echo like adult supporters of, <laughs> I don't wanna call them allies because that's a whole other conversation, but like adult accomplices are like probably one of the major rules that youth or young people right now need um, to be able to take that next step in their, um, in their chapter. Yeah, I see. So there's something in the chat box being said about, I think that Gen Z might be the generation that gets, that gets rid of the rug or the broom that's sweeping the stuff under the rug. Right. So there's there's nothing, you know, we're not very you all are not very comfortable hiding things or not talking about things and not being transparent. And so um, and there's another question here about, you know, how can we. How can the, the generations before you, you know, what are some things that are invisible to us or misunderstood and how can we how can we how can we continue to use that bridge that Natalie was speaking to and, and also honoring, you know, the elders and honoring the knowledge that came before you. I can That's open it. to anyone. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like, like I kind of mentioned it before, um, we kind of have a tendency just to learn by making mistakes because we're not really like ingrained in institutions as heavily. So they're not, cause they're not made for us. We end up just having to struggle our way through before we figure out what the system is, what, how it has transformed and how we can dismantle it. I feel like that's the biggest thing, like across generations that we could really work on the most making, cause one of the things that uh, I'm an Afro major. So one of the things like that's kind of core in our, in our understanding is that information doesn't just go one way. It, that we don't just become the recipients of the information and move on with it. I feel like the biggest thing is we have to take this home. We have to take this to our communities and vice versa. The community has to talk to us about things we had no idea about because we, we kind of grew up, we kind of grew up in a transitional time where like, although TikTok and all these spaces are good for us, they're kind of, they're also used to gentrify us. They're also used to, to really like mimic our culture while, while not giving anything back to it. Hmm. So I feel like the, in terms of like the older generations, it's more so just to, to keep telling stories, to keep passing on memories, because a lot of times, at least, at least through, through my experiences, a lot of times people, people that are from the community that have been victims of violence from the, from the, from the state, they're not alive or they're not in positions of power to tell their stories. So I feel like the biggest part is keeping their story alive and making sure that because that system of erasure is really big and they, they, they love to suppress it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the saying violent or silence is violence is true. And so if we're silent on these matters, nothing's gonna change, you know, with Black Lives Matter, with anything, with um, gender equality, um immigration anything like if we don't talk about it no one's gonna do anything to change it and so it begins with a conversation and i think what the older generations need to take into account is that we're not just we are just a bunch of kids but we have learned a lot and we know what like we shouldn't be discounted automatically just because of our age because we've shown over and over again that the young people are the ones that are leading the movements with help from their community and their support. And so I think that the older generations need to realize that there is power in a movement of young people and that that needs support in the way of um, care and community and not like, being discounted and like hmm. overlooked, I suppose. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think it goes back to these intergenerational spaces too. Um, I love elders. Like I love, I feel like I have an old soul. Like I love talking to older uh, folks because they have so much to share. Um, and their stories, right? Like some stories that go untold uh, and it's a huge part of like that wisdom and knowledge that they have. 
Um, but it's also understanding and acknowledging that older, older folks do have traditional views and perceptions and they have to be willing to learn. Um, and, and that in itself, like it's, it's a whole process to be able to get young people, elders um, in, in a space where they're both receptive, right? Um, I worked with young people who are like, no, hear me, like, I'm saying this, I'm saying that, right? And we have to like work through, hey, like, we're gonna make sure they hear you, but, you know, learn, acknowledge that there's something for you to learn on their end as well. Um, so how do we create that balance? I feel like that's something that's still being explored at the moment um, because intergenerational spaces are, is a lot more common now and, and it's a lot more powerful as a collective. So I think that's something that like I, I try really hard to explore when I work with youth or even in my own situation. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, there's somebody asking, um, are you afraid of what the world will look like 10, 20, 30 years from now? And I'm also gonna couple that with another question that somebody asked earlier, and I've been trying to fit in, is that um, a lot of folks only characterize Gen Z as the, the issue of climate change. Like that's the one that we gotta focus on because we don't know, you know, we, we can't turn back time in terms of how we're taking care of the earth. So how, how, how are you making space to balance you know, climate change, but also all this other stuff. And then are you afraid? Well, I mean, climate change is a direct result of colonialism and white supremacy. So we can't fight one without the other. Um, and so I feel like characterizing our generation as just the climate change generation ignores the intersections and the complexities and the nuances of climate change, because it's not just global warming. It's, um, it's toxic dumps in poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods of colors and communities of color. And um, so like, I feel like we can't say that we're just a climate change generation. We are climate change, Black Lives Matter, trans rights, disability rights, healthcare rights, it's all interconnected. And so I feel like once you understand that, it's easier to see that it's not just climate change. Climate change is a big web of, of like supremacy, white supremacy. There's a lot of fire going on in the chat right now, Ezra. There's a lot of like, go off, you better go. Like, yes, speak on it. <laughs> I love that. I actually just watched, finished watching The Politician on Netflix and there's a whole commentary on uh, a mother and a daughter and how they decide to vote and the issues that they talk about and they brought up oh your generation's only concerned about climate change and the daughter said well if there's not a world that we can live in none of these other issues are going to apply mm -hmm. so definitely echoing what Ezra said it's our generation through technology is starting to piece together history that was hidden from us because what are we doing right now? We're trying to contextualize the world that we're living in so that we can best equip ourselves to take change. Mm. Because history was hidden from us, so many things have gotten away. So many systems of oppression have continued and connected and united. And that's kind of why we're in the situation. So I think because of technology, because we've been able to expose a lot of the things that have been going on and now things no longer get quote unquote swept under the rug, you're gonna see a lot more, we are gonna see a lot more surfacing as years go by. And that's not to say that it's not always accurate or that we will get every every last piece of evidence, but I think it is important to give that credit. We're putting together our story. I mean, they tell you to question the history that you learned, who wrote it, who put it together, what story are they telling? A lot of Generation Z isn't satisfied with the history that we're gifted. You know, sometimes, the history that is indoctrinated on us. And so I have to throw it back to Lupe too. Intergenerational problems, the world, the state of the world is a product of decades of work from hands that have come generations before us. So those intergenerational problems, they demand intergenerational healing. They demand intergenerational solutions. And we need to have and need to know that older generations are here with us because I think that's something as a young professional, as a young person, 
we now are feeling this pressure. Oh, your generation's going to save the world. Mm. We're all alive on this earth. Mm. We're all alive on this earth. We don't have the capital right now. We're emerging in our careers and our lives and we're being expected to take everything into our own hands and do this. That, that makes, that makes me angry. Mm. Let's work together because this mess was made not by us, but now we're being tasked with your responsibility to heal the mess that you created for us. I'm not too sure. And I'm not saying you, Selena, and I'm not saying folks in this chat, but I'm saying this isn't a question of the future or the past. Like this is our present and multiple generations continue to exist in this present day. Just because the next younger generation came up and is starting to speak up doesn't mean that older generations are absolved of their responsibility to contribute to a better future for all of us. And it's, it's about pride. It's about being humble, but it's admitting, you know, like we did this, we got into this mess. Are we committed to our current lives and the future generations to come? I'm young. People are asking me, you want to have a family? You want to do this and this? What if the world is going to, you know, fall into a climate crisis, which it already is, Am I going to bring in a family into a world that might not exist for them? And so now we're dealing with all these questions that I think the real question that I want to know is like, are people committed to putting in the work so that maybe I can consider those questions later down the road? You know what I'm saying? Can I ask something? Just Absolutely. On Please keep it going, Symphonius. Keep it going. <laughs> I feel like a lot of this is when people try to nitpick at the different different issues. The heart of it is capitalism, really, because when you think about it, what everything precedes is capitalism. You exploit you exploit resources, you exploit people, you exploit you exploit groups of different people through capitalism. Because at the end of the day, you're seeking more wealth, more more leverage in the, in the system. And I feel like that's the biggest thing we need to keep in focus. Because when you're talking about racial justice, when you're talking about when you're talking about equality for all, you're really talking about we're challenging capitalism. We're challenging that system that that needs a hierarchy, that needs that needs a head of state, which is, which is honestly in 2020 kind of little outdated mode. And I feel like that's that's one of the biggest things that like even now is kind of getting distorted with the Black Lives Matter. It's it's capitalism before everything else because capitalism with that racial hierarchy creates a system that we that creates a that creates a hierarchy of like wealth based on race. And then once you apply cap climate change into that. It's clear that it's clear that who you see is gonna get hurt, or who you see is gonna get the mo the boatload of damage in these in these systems. It's gonna be people of color. It's gonna be women. It's gonna be children. It's gonna be trans LGBTQ plus folks. It's gonna be people that are vulnerable to these systems. And but we see a lot of white men in the head of these places articulating their thoughts and their ideas when oftentimes they're not they're gonna be the least affected, or they're gonna be the ones that are that have to deal with this at the least at the least amount. I feel it. There's and there's um you know the the chat box and the the folks that are here that you know we've already seen are are from the older generation. They want to know, you know. There's a lot of focus on MLK. There's a lot of focus on Malcolm X. But who are your leaders that you look up to? Who are your the biggest influencers? Um, I really look up to Michelle Alexander, who wrote the new Jim Crow. Um, that was honestly the most life-changing book I've ever read. Um, Angela Davis, obviously. And then another one that I look up to a lot and have learned a lot from, um, her name is Rachel Cargill, um, mm -hmm. on Instagram. I want to hear from everybody. Keep it going. Okay. I look up to my mom. I look up to my dad. To my family, I think those are probably the people that I've learned a lot from. Probably is not necessarily right, like the correct terminology and language that they they to share with me, but um, their resiliency and just like uh, the way to learn the, the way that they learn to navigate these systems, even without having a degree, like that blows my mind. Uh, and now I'm just like, oh my god, how did you even do it? Like I don't even know how to uh, navigate where I'm at. Um, so I feel like I, I'm very based in in my family uh, and their lessons and teachings um, and my mentors. Um, I've had mentors that I've known for like eight years and have helped me transition from like a youth to like a young adult and are currently helping me learn <laughs> how to navigate um, this professional world and career uh, 
um, their workforce. So um, I, I do think that like, they're probably my most biggest um, inspiration um, and teachings that I received. Who's next? Yeah, I mean, same here, same as Lupe. I think my parents are probably for sure my biggest inspiration. Um, and uh, throughout all the struggles that they have been through, they still managed to be so positive. Um, they managed to, to always keep their heads up and they're always just looking for the, for the betterment of, of, of their children. Um, so it definitely would be my parents. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna have to echo what the rest of the panel has said so far because my parents were the ones that like that sacrificed for themselves because they understood they understood that the progress is generational. They understood that if they struggled today, that I would have a better future tomorrow. And I mean, just that kind of dedication alone, like you don't sometimes a lot of times you don't see that from family, you don't see that from blood. So then seeing that that kind of dedication they had in me was something different. And that, that goes on to, to my mentors, people like Jordan Harrison, to the coaches that I've had that initially kind of planted those seeds of the inequalities or just planted seeds of just curiosity in me that, I, that my educational system didn't really, didn't really put into me. It was, you know, it's like you can't be here without them building you up. Mm. I also got to say that too. Very family oriented. Um, I'm the child of two parents who are on the cusp of millennial and Gen X. And so what you see is that a lot of millennials are, are not millennial and Gen X, Gen X and baby boomers. So a lot of millennials are kids of baby boomers. And there's a lot of discussion around that. A lot of Gen Zers are children of Gen, Gen Y, Gen X. And so we're seeing these generational gaps, right? But we also got to recognize that we are continuously shaped by their struggle. The way that I was brought up, it was made a comment that we were born into the knowledge. I was also born into the movement. Like mm -hmm. my parents were the first people to expose me to any of this kind of work. Why it was important for me as a young person to own my agency and to give myself a voice. And I can still say that I am being shaped by their activism and then by the development and personalities of my siblings who are much younger than me, much, much younger Gen Zers than me. And they continue to shape who I am and inspire me because not only are we taking their struggles and their lessons and they're gifting that to us already, but I can see the future generation that I'm a part of, even younger than me. And I think about how am I going to be creating a world with them that they're gonna wanna live in. Um, it's just really interesting because it feels like we get really caught up in this whole, my generation is doing this and your generation isn't doing anything. Um, and that divide and conquer mentality just shows up time and time and again. And so for folks who aren't Gen Z on this call, um, this is also just a, a reaching out to you all. Like we do want to work together. I, I think we can get caught up in this idea that it's your fault or you're not doing anything or you don't understand me. We're kind of past the point where it's just pointing fingers. They said this, they said that. Like we want to work together we've all been touched by people outside of our generation. And that just goes to show that the work is going to continue like that. Yeah, I wanted to add that like, the people who first ignited my passion, I met when I was 10, 11, 12 in middle school, um, you know, Roxanne and my mom met in at USD um, in grad school. And they have both taught me so much and watching that goes back to like how being in school is so transformative because I wasn't even in school. I was 11 when my mom was in grad school. And so I wasn't taking classes, but I learned so much and she was able to gather that information and pass it down to me. And I, that's my pursuit with education is to get as much information as I can and carry it on and carry it on in meaningful and powerful and change making ways. Wow. And I think um, it's, it's, it's even causing me to think about how we use this term about first in our families to go to college when as if 
folks before us weren't educated on things as if, as if they didn't give us things as if we didn't, you know, grasp some kind of knowledge from them. Um, so I, I, I hear y'all and, and just know that I'm, you know, I'm nodding in appreciation and I'm nodding um, in celebration of, I think of everything that um, was shared here uh, this evening. Um, there's just time for one more question. It sounds like, and I do want everybody to answer it. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna try my best to get, I'm, there's, a, there's a lot happening in the chat box in the Q and A. Um, so what, is, what do you think is different of, in the way that you organize? Um, and let's try to add this piece in about what part of your education, and it doesn't have to be from an institution, it could be from our families. What part of that education um, has helped you inform, inform, inform you on that? in the way that you organize. I feel like I'm early in my in my transition and in my process towards um towards organizing because I've never really seen myself as like an innovator and I felt like that kind of vision that you need to have to organize is something a little bit bigger. And I've just recently just been starting to think about different ways and different different methods and avenues that I could use to to uplift and to spread message, and and that's part of it is probably because of my education system. Really thinking about like my lower educations and my and my initial initial interactions with academia, I was never I was never prepared or suited to to handle Berkeley to handle anything else outside of outside of City Heights, and I feel like that's the biggest thing about about um about youth leadership. Because you see, you're seeing a lot of kids, a lot of like teenage adolescents in these protests, in these in these moments, because they're so interested, because they're more informed than we were because of the access to information. And I feel like that's like like y'all were talking about one of the biggest things. But for me, I'm still kind of kind of going through the process. I'm still trying to trying to understand what it means to have my voice and to how how I can actually make it make it matter for something. Right now, I'm working at the Black Resource Center on campus, so we're we're working with you know Garden to help with food scarcity. We're helping with different things, so more so on a programming level. That's that's where I'm mo more focused on now. But recently, just just being being kind of like woken up to this to how to organize and how to how to plan and who can do it because that's one of the things that I've been I've been kind of debunking in my head as I've been watching a lot of teenagers, a lot of kids, a lot of grown, like people of different age groups, different walks of life are organizing and are, and are actively pushing back. So that's actually kind of inspired me to change my perception on who can organize and who can, who can lead, lead the way or be part of the fight. Yeah, I would have to agree with them. I mean, uh, I also am still learning a lot. I'm still growing and I, I have a lot more to go. Um, but I think one of the ways that I've been able to, um, I guess, cause some change is actually just through being in it, inside the systems that I'm trying to um, dismantle and uh, from within. So when I was at La Jolla High School, um, that would be causing disruption. Um, you know, just going calling out um, things that weren't right um, with the, the Mecha Club and things like that. Um, also here at SASU. Um, for example, uh, there's this uh, business group that I'm in and, you know, it, I'm like the only person of color in the group. And so, you know, just having real discussions and, and being, uh, um, being smart about it. So I don't want to burn any bridges, but I'm also going to stand up for myself and I'm going to make sure that people are acknowledging um, or just, just taking into account, um, you know, that that there's other things that they can be thinking about in terms of checking their privilege and stuff like that. Um, and so I think that um, school has helped me out a lot in that and, and some courses that I've taken at CSU, a lot of it has been um, BLCI as well though, that they have been able to, uh, they have taught me a lot about that. Um, so I guess my main way of organizing right now is um, through direct action, like protesting, um, and then writing. I'm a writer, so I've been writing a lot and um, plan to publish it somewhere. And I'm creating, I've, I've founded a couple of organizations, um, one called Just a Bunch of Kids, which is directly uh, focused on helping 
youth have access to resources to be activists. Um, there's like a protest guide and like other resources and, and things like that. So I really am focusing on that. And then on campus, I'm working with um, the University Senate to re entirely rewrite the public safety handbook essentially because of the way that they mishandled the hate crime. And so those are the two main focuses of mine right now. I, could go ahead. Um, I think for me, I, I started organizing when I was 14 um, here in City Heights. So I was fairly young when I was introduced to youth and community organizing um, and have I have slowly like stepped away from on the ground grassroots um, and currently I'm doing more statewide youth leadership development infrastructure um, and what it means to have a collective statewide uh, structure and practices for young people. Um, but for me is is very, I, I, I like to say I was very I don't want to say lucky, but I had the privilege to be with an organization, City Heights, who equipped me with the tools that I needed um, to understand these systems and understand the social justice movement and um, try to continue my work as a young leader. And, and for me, it's like, how do I make sure that every young person in the state has that one organization? Um, so I, I continue to explore that and what a a statewide leadership infrastructure looks like and it's not so um right decentralized uh, uh, for, across the state because it's, it's very and <laughs> yeah inequitable on in terms of access and resources um and i think i, I think a big part of that is, is understanding um the importance of, of just having adult mentors <laughs> um like when you have an adult mentor like it's just a bit much easier to navigate and, and, and have access to to more resources and opportunities um and, and i always challenge older folks like go find a mentee <laughs> um because it's real and sometimes young people don't know how to ask for mentors and they don't even know um right that there's someone out there who wants to help mm -hmm. um and so I'm, I'm learning myself, like, okay, now I'm a young professional. How do I keep continue and getting more mentors in this field? Um, because my mentors technically are my friends now. And that's a whole other transition uh, that young people go through. So um, I, I think it's just, uh, it's something I think uh, Gen Z and just millennials are also kind of trying to understand more what this um, organizing world is and how our role changes in organizing social justice movements mm -hmm. um, from grassroots organizers to adult mentors to you know somehow some of them go into public like public officials and that's yes, still yeah. part of that organizing um, and how, how do we shape that right that like if you enter the um, policy world like you could still contribute to your your people in your community um yeah those are just things that i think I, i'm still processing and learning and working through <laughs> um natalie <laughs> thank you honestly again i gotta say it it's so inspiring to see people who are younger than me who've been doing this work longer than i have and to be considered you know of equal it's amazing i'm inspired i'm i'm honestly so inspired and I'm used to the direct action, putting on programs, going out, but we're in the middle of a pandemic and I live in a multi-generational household with folks who are high risk. And so I've been needing to re reevaluate the way that I understand my organizing, my activism during this time. I wouldn't say that I'm doing it different or unique, but adopting values of mentorship and of storytelling and then just this deep, authentic servant leadership. I think those are the things that really do make my work, my work. Work inspired by people before me, work that I learned from Sama Hung Filipino at UCLA, inner work that I had to do when I went through the RISE Fellowship Program and work that I continue to do with Unipro San Diego right now, 
the thing that has connected me to people of all identities, all generations is stories. And to see that these lessons, that this wisdom and that the answers come time and time again through these stories of different people, whether it's personal, it's history, that has been such a huge connecting force for me. And it's how we've been able to reach people where they're at. It's a language that people understand when they can see themselves in the work, they want to be a part of it. Um, and, and really connecting to something that you believe in, it makes the work all that much more. So I think if I wanted to leave anybody with anything today, um, for all generations, get organized. We're seeing a lot of people get knowledgeable, learning, learning, and practicing unsustainable forms of advocacy. Find an organization or an initiative or a project, something bigger than yourself that can help you strategically organize your energy and your time so that it best, best fits your personal life, but that you also are able to connect with people across generations and across spaces and work on these larger initiatives, statewide organizing, national organizing, international organizing, none of this is isolated. Um, and I think the, the next step for a lot of folks after you become aware and awakened is to start joining something that you deeply and personally align with. And it doesn't matter if you're late, you know, if you're a baby boomer, if you're anything older than a Gen Zer in general, we need all folks on deck, all generations on deck. There's a lot of problems out there. There are a lot of things that are demanding healing and fixing and justice. And we need everybody where they feel they best belong. There's a place for everybody in this movement and everybody in this work, as you've seen in these panelists, amazing, and we all cover such different areas of interest. There's a place for you in this. And so we're excited. I'm excited, and I think that's what it is. We can't stop telling our story, and we can't stop sharing and connecting folks in their stories. When we're silenced, you know, things, things happen to us and they get away with it. But we're talking now. And we need more spaces like this, not just Gen Z talking, but let's do an intergenerational dialogue where we can create solutions together. This is just the beginning. Thanks. There we have it, y'all. Gen Z is doing it and doing it and doing it well. Um, so what I heard was uh, there's a call for, for some intergenerational relationships. I heard mentorship, mentor, you know, I heard that, but I also heard this idea that it's co-created. There's not a, don't get it twisted about there being a power dynamic. I think that we can learn from each other, that the young are learning from the old and the old are going to have to learn from the young and everything in between. So thank you all so much again for, for, for tuning in. Thank you all so much um, for joining us on the panel. Um, Tony Young, if you can go ahead and wrap this up for us. Well, first of all, Selena, I, I just like the fact that you used a, a Gen X uh, anthem by LL Cool J. You know, <laughs> that was that was really good. I appreciate that. Um, you know, listen. You know, first of all, thank you, panelists. The uh, the chat room had all kinds of comments about you all. When you get back and look at it, you'll um, you'll really uh, see how uh, um, interesting this discussion was and how mu how much people really enjoyed it. Um, my, little, my little small message to you is that, you know, you're going to find that, um, you know, some of, some of us, some of the older folks are going to try to hold on to power and influence until you pry it out of their cold, dead hands. And that's really unfortunate, but it's true, right? But there are some, um, and I, I see myself as one of them, who are willingly uh, want to support, you know, let you, not let you, but recognize your leadership and find ways like Lupe was saying to support and mentor you so you can change the world to where you want it to be and and, and you know I, I don't have any true opinion on what it's going to be like in regards for the, the world that you'll live in but I, the opinion that I do have is that the people in front of me deserve a world that they want and they expect and they can mold and, and create so just know that that you do have people who are not from your generation that do are like just rooting you on because we do believe in you. You guys are brilliant. Um, I don't know if you even recognize how brilliant you are right now, uh, but you are. And I, I, it's almost like we watched this today. And it was, it was like, we were, we were um, watching the future. Like I can see you all 
uh, and I can see what America is going to look like just by looking at you all right now. So uh, thank you for the comments. And, and as I said, it's, I'm not, uh, no joke here. I, I, I do believe that you all are, are going to lead this world into a place that's going to be amazing. Um, and with that, uh, you know, the, the old lady, Selena uh, Viegas, uh, I appreciate your moderation of this. You were amazing. This is, uh, I think this was your first time moderating a Rise Now event. And it was, it was, it was really good. And, and I thought she, you really pulled it out of these, these folks and they, they, you did a good job. So we appreciate you, Queen. You did a great job. Um, so uh, before, there's a couple of things before the audience leaves. Uh, you know, we, as you all know, we have a number of programs at Rise. Uh, one of them is a nonprofit and small business a training program. Um, so if you get on uh, that site that you see on the screen there, uh, the website, you can get information about that. And if you, you um, register, you'll get details on, on what our next event is. Um, our next uh, Rise Now event will be Thursday, uh, August 13th at 6 p.m. Um, and you'll see that we'll have some interesting dialogue. One of the things we're working on is working uh, with assembly member Shirley Weber to, um, to, to discuss uh, the Black Caucus agenda. Um, Selena is working with us to, to talk uh, about that and then we'll kind of move from there but, um, and, and discuss in more detail as the, as the series goes on. But that's one of the things we're working on. Um, but one of the things that you all have to promise is that we want you all to come back. If you can come back and, and have this discussion, maybe on some, some, some of the specific things that you talked about today, uh, we would really love to hear this panel again. So, um, you know, Lupe, Ezra, Nudo, Azriel, and Sophonius, Sof 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 I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, before everybody leaves, we have a poll question. Um, the question is, overall, how would you rate the virtual event? and um, try to find ways to, to let us know how we do and what we need to do to improve. And so with that, uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Selena, and everyone have a wonderful, wonderful evening. God bless you. All right, panelists, if you can please, if you can just stay on just for one or two more minutes while we wait for the um, attendees to finish the survey. I know we lost a couple of us. Oh no. Let's see, got a couple more.